died and gone to hell or came and have come back from hell. And it is not a place you joke about. It's not a place to laugh about. And it's not a place to be taken lightly. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, Paul says, we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he's done in the body, whether good or evil. So this is why judgment day is so significant. Every single person is going to stand before God. Every single person listening, you cannot send an attorney. You can't send a lawyer, a pastor, a parent. You must stand before God on that great day of judgment. It'll be you and God, and nobody will escape that great and dreadful day. Now, the reason why it's called a great and dreadful day, because for some, it'll be a great day. For others, it will be a dreadful day. Now, it's clear in this video, Megan Fox did not go to actual hell. But I do know a man personally who went to hell for 23 minutes and came back to tell the story. This is Bill Wees, a friend of mine. I want you to hear his story, not Megan Fox's now, his story of what hell was like. And you're going to see it is nothing like what Megan Fox described. This is one of Satan's strategies to make hell seem like not a big deal. It's not a big deal if you go there. This is an eternal place of torment. Listener discretion is advised. Some of this is graphic. Maybe, maybe, well, I would say... I would have kids listen. I was going to say it's not appropriate for kids, but your kids should know about this place. Now, this is Bill Wee's describing how he went to hell for 23 minutes and what hell was really like. Check this out. Nothing unusual about the night. Um, I had never studied the topic, topic of hell at that point. I had never gone to dark movies. I've never drank. I've never taken drugs. And I never had a vision before. We come home like any other normal night. I got up at 3 o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. I was walking to our kitchen. And right in about the living room, something grabbed me and pulled me out of my body like being drawn up out of your body and i found myself falling through the air down this long tunnel and i was getting hotter and hotter and i landed on a stone floor in a prison cell in hell i was fully awake and cognizant just like i'm standing here now i had no idea how i got there or why i was there a filthy stinking smoke filled but like a dungeon but see, Isaiah 24, 22 says, and they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. The word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17, 16 says they shall go down to the bars of the pit. Jonah 2, 6, the earth with her bars was about me forever. And the Tyndale, the New International, many other commentaries point out that Jonah was at the gates of hell and that it was literal bars and gates. That's why I first found myself. And the first thing I noticed was the intense heat. It was so far beyond the ability to sustain life. I wondered, how could it be alive in this place? And uh, I, w I wanted to get up and run. That was my first reaction. But I noticed I had no physical strength in my body. It took so much effort to move. But see, Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Now, if you ever had the flu and you felt weak, a thousand times worse. Any movement takes tremendous effort. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, In him we live and move and have our being. Movement isn't automatic. It's from God. I looked up in the cell and I saw these two enormous beasts, creatures, pacing like a vicious caged animal. And these particular two are about 12 or 13 feet tall. It's not an exaggeration. I could give you scripture for that too, but I got to keep moving. And um, they were reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, uh, huge jaw, sunken in eyes claws about a foot long and um they were uh pacing like the most vicious animal and the one of them picked me up like i weighed the weight of a like this bottle threw me into the wall of this prison cell i hit the wall i felt as if every bone in my body had broken now a spirit maybe doesn't have bones but it felt that way i collapsed on the floor wondering how could it be alive through this but I have to explain one thing. I understood that I did not feel most of the pain. I had the understanding that it was being blocked. And I didn't understand, but on the way back, the Lord explained to me that he blocked most of the pain. But he did allow me to feel a small amount of it so I could relate to people. It's not metaphorical. It's not a state of the mind. <laughs> Why are you crying, Cana? <laughs> it's real literal pain you're going to feel in hell. But the amount I felt was enough. The other demon grabbed me, picked me up and dug its claws into my chest and just tore the flesh open. 
Again, how, how could I be alive through this? I should be dead. I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And remember Luke 16, the rich man Jesus talked about in hell. He wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He had a mouth to speak. He had eyes to lip. He had a tongue. So you have some kind of a body in hell, but it withstands these torments. But something else I noticed, there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. It was just all dry. But see, Leviticus 17, 11 says, The life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says, Thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They hate you. And But see, Psalms 103, 17 says, The mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell. So you don't derive that benefit. And... Um, about this time it went dark now I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see to describe to people what it looks like but then he withdrew his light and hell resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness but Lamentations 3 6 says he has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old Jude 13 mentions blackness of darkness forever but it wasn't just dark you could actually feel it and that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. Uh, it's so wicked and evil that the darkness just seems to penetrate through every cell in your body. I was taken out of this prison cell and I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. This pit was about a mile across, like a huge hole in the ground, about a mile across, deep hole. I, I don't know how I knew it was a mile. I just understood that it was. I can't explain that, but there, this was filled with fire, flames raging high up into this open cavern. And, um, you know, so it's not metaphorical fire like some say, it's real, literal flames. I felt the heat, I saw the fire, but more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Psalms 11, 6 says, upon the wicked, he will rain fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. Psalms 140, verse 10, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13, 49, the angels to sever the wicked from the just and cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. Isaiah 33, 12 says, the people shall be as the burnings of lime. They shall be as thorns cut up and thrown into the fire and burned. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Many more verses about fire. But this is where I could first see people. I could see through the flames. And it's the most awful sight to see a person on fire. Most of us have never seen that. But to see someone burning. Now, I could not distinguish a man from a woman. They just look like skeletons. And it appeared to me like flesh hanging off their bones. I, it was the most horrible sight. And the screams coming from the people was so loud and deafening. You want to get away from the screams, but you can't. But Isaiah 57, 21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There's no peace of mind of any kind. But see, Isaiah 32, 18 says, My people dwell in a quiet resting place. You're not God's people. She won't ever get to enjoy quiet. You hear, hear these horrible screams forever. Uh, I understood I was down deep in the earth. I descended to get there. I ascended when I left. Uh, but I understood that's where I was at. But more importantly, there's 49 scriptures that point out where the current hell or Hades is. I'll just give you two addresses. Ezekiel 26, 20, number 16, 32, and 33. Very clear it's down deep in the earth. I also understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation. That infers a lesser damnation. Or Matthew 10, 15, he said, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That infers a less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10, 28 says, of how much worse of a punishment Suppose it shall be for you, you who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. There's a worse punishment. But my point is there is no tolerable, comfortable level in hell. Any level is far worse than your mind can even conceive. I wanted to uh, let my wife know where I was at. I just wanted to say goodbye. But I understood I'll never get that opportunity. See, Job 7.9 says, He that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. Sheol is the Hebrew word for the current hell. Hades is a Greek word. But I had to understand I'll never get out. And see, you don't know what that's... Well, you can't imagine what that's like to have no finality with your family. 
it, you can't say goodbye. You, you can never tell them where you're at. See, death does not mean cease to exist. Death means separation from God. You cease to, you still exist down deep in the earth. And to never see her again, to not let her know where I'm at and say goodbye, that thought alone was really tormenting to endure that you have to endure for all eternity. I mean, you'll never see any of your family. You'll never hug your kids again. Nothing. That's gone. Thing of the past. I wanted to talk to a person, just anybody, because there's pleasure, right, in being with people. Even if you don't know them, it's pleasure to be with a person. But see, those people I saw in the pit, they're all kept at a distance. So you have no conversation. You're isolated. You're by yourself in hell for all eternity. You'll never have another conversation with anybody. And you have no purpose, no destiny. It's just a complete useless wasting away. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, There is no work, no device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here. No one would know who you are there. You have no identity. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says, Your name is covered in darkness. And you're forgotten in hell. Psalms 88.12, Isaiah 26.14, Deuteronomy 32.26. All these point out that you're completely forgotten. You know, that's an awful thing. That, that nobody up on the earth has given you a thought. You know, most people don't realize that most people are down in hell. You know, if you go to a funeral today, no matter what the religion, they usually say, well, they've gone to a better place. But that's not true. Jesus said in Matthew 7, many are going to hell and few are going to heaven. The stench in hell is the most foul, putrid, disgusting odors, worse than any open sewer, anything you can imagine. But remember, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, Mark 9, 25. Demons have a disgusting foul odor to them uh, death, decay and also flesh, people burning that is a disgusting odor also and on top of that you know, the smell of burning sulfur now if you go to Hawaii to the volcano they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxicity of the sulfur coming up it's called sulfur dioxide and if you breathe it, it will kill you it's toxic well sulfur is just another word for brimstone and the word brimstone's all through the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, putrid, disgusting air that you don't want to breathe. And it's, I mean, it uh, would make you vomit. And, but it's even worse than that because there's not enough air to breathe in hell. You can't take a nice deep breath. You don't get to do that in hell. There's not enough oxygen. So maybe only an asthma patient can relate to this or a fireman. Uh, this is how you breathe in hell. It was like... That was as much air as you could get. Well, it's not enough. You have the feeling of suffocation. And that's going on for all eternity. But see, Isaiah 42, 5 says, The Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. God's very specific with his word. You need to sleep in hell. You never get to go to sleep. Now, if you've ever stayed up for two nights like studying for a test or something. Just try to stay up and don't go to sleep for two nights. You can't even function after two days. You're a wreck. Well, in hell, you need to sleep also. But you never get to go to sleep. Revelation 14, 10 and 11 says, uh, And they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, that primarily means no rest from the torment but no rest of any kind because Isaiah 57 20 said the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest you know, this, you know the sea is always moving cannot rest. you can't rest in hell you never get to go to sleep so you have that feeling ongoing and it gets progressively worse every day but see Psalms 127 2 uh, says the Lord gives his beloved sleep again you're not his beloved you don't get to enjoy the benefit of sleep I was standing next to this big pit of fire. Now, I have to explain, a pit a mile across here on the earth would produce a lot of light, right? A filled with fire, that would produce light. But in hell, it doesn't. It is so dark, it consumes the light. It doesn't let the light escape. But I could just see through the flames and along the edges. And uh, along the edges um, were individual pits of fire that some people were in their own individual pit. Others were in this big pit. Some were in prison cells. And along, I noticed I was standing beneath a cavern, cavern walls that were ascending up were like a tunnel going up. And all along the cavern walls were demons, all different sizes and shapes, twisted, deformed, and grotesque, all of them. 
and some were only two and three feet tall, some were 12 and 13 feet tall. Uh, there were spiders, demons that looked like spiders, but some of them were three and four feet across. I can't give you scripture for that, but I can give you scripture for demons that look like frogs, Revelation 16, 13, and uh, read Revelation 9. John describes a demon coming out of the bottomless pit, the most bizarre creature. Read about that. There's some really bizarre looking things in hell. Horrible. And I noticed, though, I was standing on a bed of maggots, solid maggots crawling all over everything and everybody. But remember, Jesus said, where their worm dies not, and the fire is not quenched. And he used the word maggot. And I never knew this, but if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, when they consume the flesh, the maggots die. And that's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not. Because the flesh is never fully consumed in hell, so the maggot feeds sweetly on thee, as Job 24.20 says. Feeds sweetly on thee. Is that disgusting enough? See, Isaiah 14.11 says, where the maggot is spread under thee, and the worm will cover thee. Look it up in the original, it's the word maggot. The fear level that you experience in hell is so far beyond anything you can imagine. You can see the difference there between actual hell, what the Bible says about hell, and what Megan Fox says on one of the biggest talk shows, late night talk shows in the world, and describing hell as just this place she went to in her imagination. But the Bible speaks of something much different. This is an absolutely terrifying place where there's no exits, there's no escaping. Once you go there, you never return. A hundred million years will go by in hell and it'll be like the first day you arrive. Guys, we need to not only warn our friends and family about this place, preach about this place, but make sure that we never end up there. This is absolutely a terrifying place. It's a real place. It's going on right now. People are being tormented as you listen to this video. So I just wanna challenge you what the Bible describes hell, as Bill Weiss just described it, is an absolutely terrifying place. Make sure that you're in right standing with God. Make sure that you're where you need to be. The Bible says that many people are going to go to hell, that few are on the narrow road that leads to life. So choose that narrow road. I hope this put a burden on you. I hope this put just a conviction on you to share with your friends and family and to make sure you never end up in a place called hell. Jesus came to save us from this place, to deliver us from this place. If this video blessed you, share it with a friend or family. Maybe you have an unsafe family or friend that needs to hear this video it might help them out go ahead and share it with them it, it really means a lot to me like comment write what you think down below what do you think about hell